Should come. I, I should probably also apologise for being that annoying uh, flyby speaker today. Um, I'm in the middle of running a big European collaboration conference just across the road, so um, I will try and be interesting despite not really having heard the start of the conversation. So um, what I want to talk about, I, I just want to quickly touch on a couple of the conference themes um, from an experience of running the Zooniverse, which is the largest collection of online data analysis citizen science projects. So when people think of citizen science, I think they often think of um, <laughs> traditional forms such as amateur astronomers uh, discovering supernovae or monitoring variable stars, uh, bird watchers submitting data, uh, and, and all of that's very valuable. Um, but we actually came to this from the opposite problem, problem, which is in astronomy, the professionalization of data collection. And so just to illustrate this, cutting edge astronomy 100 years ago looked like this. This is a, it's actually a bit older than uh, 100 years. So this is a, um, a sketch of a galaxy. And if you wanted to understand how the universe formed and evolved, you'd be arguing about what this thing was. Um, you wouldn't know it was an island universe of hundreds of billions of stars. Um, these days, galaxy surveys look like this, where every dot in this image is a galaxy. And so you know, we can have surveys that take 10 years to do, create 300 million objects, uh, and maybe give us good images of a million galaxies. And so in uh, about 2006, we were confronted with this problem. This is actually, I should say, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a canonical open science example. This is a, a big, massive project that released its data and metadata and tools uh, as they came off the production line. And so we were trying to look at the shapes of these galaxies. And this is a task that computers can only perform to about 70%, even if you use advanced neural networking. Um, and we, we experimentally discovered that students would look at about 50,000 galaxies uh, before they became dissatisfied with life and threatened to leave. Um, and, and so we have a scaling problem. I'm not allowed 20 students, especially if they keep leaving. Um, and so we decided to, to put this on the web, and we created a website called Galaxy Zoo which showed a random image of the galaxy and asked simple questions about shapes. This is just a pattern recognition problem. Uh, I'm sure we've got some computer science people in, in the room, so uh, to be clear, I'm not claiming this is uh, formally a hard AI problem. I'm not saying this is something that you could never use a computer to do. Um, my guess is that it's probably a couple of postdocs and two and three years to develop a routine that would nail this. But of course, you can't do that for every project, and no one had done that. And so we needed to scale human effort to the scale of this problem, which is fine if it produces useful results. And Galaxy Zoo achieved very quickly both of the metrics of success for one of these projects. Firstly, it attracted an audience. Uh, within a day, we were doing 70,000 classifications an hour. Uh, but it also attracted uh, an audience who were capable of uh, completing the task. And we, of course, as ever with these crowdsourcing things, we had lots of people looking at each image, uh, and so we could successfully sort our galaxies out into different categories. What you have to do to make this rigorous is convince other people that your results are good. Um, it's interesting, there's a sort of psychology to this. If a single student had looked at a million galaxies, my guess is that one could publish papers and assert that the student knew what they were doing. But because we'd had hundreds of thousands of people look at these galaxies, uh, we've, we were required correctly to, to demonstrate that we'd done something good. And to give you an idea of the subtlety of the effect, one of the things we were interested in looking in was following up a bizarre result from a guy called Michael Longo, who claimed that there were more anti-clockwise galaxies than clockwise galaxies in the universe, which is a result that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, the direction of the spiral arms tells you which way the galaxy is turning. So for this to be true, we'd need a cosmic conspiracy across about half the sky with all the galaxies knowing that they had to line up in a particular way. Um, so we thought this was just a case of not having looked at enough galaxies. It's a statistical fluke. Uh, but to our surprise, even with a couple of hundred thousand spiral galaxies, we saw this effect as well. And so you start to wonder, well, you enjoy winding up theorists at this point, uh, but you also do some practical tests. And we flipped the images so that we were showing the mirror images. 
of these galaxies. And if this had been a real feature in the universe, then you'd now expect more clockwise than anticlockwise galaxies. But actually, we still got more anticlockwise galaxies. So there is something in the human brain that makes it easier to see spiral arms when they look like this than when they look like this. And in fact, this is an instance of what in psychology is known as the ballerina effect. So if you imagine looking down on the ballerina, how many people see a rotating clockwise? Also an exercise in peer pressure. How many people see her rotating anti-clockwise? How many people have seen a switch? If you wave your head from side to side, it sometimes helps to, uh, to switch. It also amuses me. Good. Uh, this is, there is no switch here. It's to do with the way that the brain is processing this uh, image, uh, and it's to do with issues of left brain, and the illusion is to do with issues of left brain and right brain. But the key point is that we had enough classifications in Galaxy Zoo that we could measure that effect and adjust for it. And it's the same process that you would have done if you'd written a brand new neural network routine, or, or which in, I guess in a way we had. Um, you have to test the parameters of your classification system. But once you've done that, you can produce data sets that are uh, shareable and usable. And there are more than 100 publications that now use Zooniverse data. Here are some recent ones. I was quite pleased we had our first uh, paparology uh, publication the other day. Um, and this is really just to illustrate that we, this is just some of them, uh, but to illustrate that we successfully produce data sets that are of use to, um, to the scientific communities. Of course, one can go further. I've talked so far as if we're treating everyone's classifications as equal. Uh, but with crowdsourcing, you're not obligated to listen to the whole crowd equally. We can listen and find people in the crowd who can perform well on various tasks. So this is an example from a different project. The task is almost irrelevant. We have a classification task. This is time, and this is the behavior of a single user. Uh, and good for this project uh, would have the blue line running along the top of this uh, Toblerone-shaped uh, prism. Um, and the red line running along the bottom. Uh, so you see this user is consistent, but not very good. Uh, but this becomes interesting when you look at the performance of a single user over time. Uh, you say this user, there's a lot of movement at the beginning. Um, so they learn, and then they're very consistent. And then so randomly, something very, very interesting happens. If you look at the left plot, what happens is that the user learns something that's wrong. And so they make an instant decision they change their mind about what one of the questions means. They see something that influences them. Um, they make a decision that's wrong, and then they change their mind and get better again. And so the challenge for us to be more rigorous is to respond to that in real time, to be able to detect that when it happens and do something about it, to train somebody, to encourage them, to direct their attention to tasks uh, that they're uh, better at. And I, I hope we might get a chance in the panel discussion to say more about that. One of the characteristics of these systems is uh, a distribution of effort. So this is a project called Old Boy. I'm skipping between projects just to give you a sort of sense of the, of the um, range of what we're up to. But this is a project called Old Weather. And, and the boxes here represent the contribution of a single, each box is one user, one volunteer, and their contribution to, in this case, the transcription of a million logbook pages. And so there's a general rule of thumb, which is that about half the classifications come from people who don't hang around very long. Some projects, that's 30%, some it's 70 uh, But nonetheless, there's a significant set of classifications for people who do the task once or twice and then leave. But equally, about half the classifications come from people who are significantly invested. And so there's a design challenge in order to get these projects to work you have to build for both of those audiences. Of course, these people become these people, but if that's all you worry about, then you lose most of these people, um, and then you don't get anything useful out of them. So we try, deliberately try and build projects uh, that engage both the new user um, and the advanced one. So we, I, 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 I've mentioned that we, we've applied this across a whole load of, of different methodologies. We don't need to list them all, but just to give you some examples, we've looked at star formation in the Milky Way. We've counted craters on the moon. We provided the most accurate forecasts of whether solar flares were going to hit Earth. Old weather, I've mentioned, is a climate project where we're rescuing uh, data from old ships' logbooks. 
Uh, we tried to determine whether whales have accents, and it seems the answer is yes. Um, we've looked at, at uh, the seafloor to assess the health, health of scallop fisheries, uh, and we even have a path uh, pathology project with Cancer Research UK to look at um, <coughs> samples in the lab. And the reason just to list those is just to say that everything I've said applies completely generically to all of those projects. We have a general methodology. But actually, it's not a hugely interesting one so far. I mean, it's not a surprise that if you give people a focused and well-designed task, that by doing it properly, by applying a little bit of scientific rigor, you get useful answers. That's the easy bit done. The interesting stuff happens when you start to remember that the people in the, the classifiers you've just been talking about are people. Everything, I, I get accused sometimes, I give seminar, astronomy seminars on our results, and I get accused of being callous, because I'm quite capable of talking about Galaxy Zoo results for more than an hour without referring to the fact that there are people involved, because they're just classifiers with behavior. And of course, they're, they're people, and they're individuals. Uh, and this, for example, is Honey van Arkel, who was a Dutch school teacher who was a Brian May fan, was inspired by Brian May's promotion of Galaxy Zoo, uh, to turn up on the site, and she was the first person to see this object, first person in history to see this object. It's a good example of why human classifiers are more interesting than computers, because a computer, if it's doing very well, will tell you that that's a, a spiral galaxy, uh, but the rest of you are wondering what the blue blob is. And so by involving people and their ability to make serendipitous discoveries, essentially the hu very human ability to be distracted we can pull out the serendipitous discoveries even on data sets that have millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of points. Uh, and this object, which is now known as Honey's Vorwerp, which roughly translates as Honey's Thingy, um, and we got that into the literature, which pleased me immensely, um, <coughs> was so important that we got time on the Hubble Space Telescope to follow up on it. I'll tell you what it is over coffee if, if you particularly want to know. But it's very exciting, even to non-astronomers. Um, and of course, as well as individuals, we have a community of people. And one of the effects of Honey discovering this object was that everyone else wanted one too. We flew her to the American Astronomical Society, and who wouldn't want to win a trip to go and hang out with 3,000 astronomers? Um, and so it's not surprising that the community organized a systematic effort to look for these things. And they found lots of them. Uh, and we have Hubble Space Telescope images of of many of these objects, which I'm not allowed to show you because they're still proprietary data. Um, so it would be terribly wrong to even give you a glimpse of these results, and I'd get into a huge amount of trouble. Of course, some are more interesting than others. So this is slightly more interesting. We've gone from people just doing our work for us to people going, this is interesting, and becoming advocates for those objects. So Honey made it very clear that she wanted us to find out what this object was. And because she was loud, uh, we got interested, and then we discovered it was interesting. But things get more interesting still, <coughs> because it turns out people, once they're, they're engaged, once they've done a simple task that they perceive as authentic, become hugely motivated to do much more than just go through clicking again and again. So on the original Galaxy Zoo, we offered a link from a page like this to the professional's view of this image which looks like this. And we didn't make any effort to explain what any of these numbers were. And yet we saw significant numbers of our volunteers engaging with this sort of thing, learning what spectra are, uh, and so on. And the best example of this, which came out of the forum that we had on the site, was something called the Galaxy Zoo Peas. So these were small, round, green galaxies that um, turn out to be the, the um, most efficient formers of stars in the local universe. They're, they're incredible objects. Um, these were found by a bunch of volunteers who self-organized, not just to find them, but to dig into the data, to download the spectra. Um, they reinvented the concept of signal to noise, to give you an example. Um, so they decided that it could only be a P if the, uh, the line that was marked O3, the mission line, uh, was 10 times greater than the average. And they invented this as novel methodology. And the first thing we knew about this was an email that said, we've discovered a new class of galaxy, and here are its properties. Um, and so they'd written sections two, three, and four of the paper. But when we came to finish it off for them and write it up, um, they didn't want their names on the paper. We wanted to give them that credit. We, that we believe very strongly that we give authentic credit to our volunteers. 
but they didn't feel that that was their place. They had enjoyed do, the, following this detective story, but I think they felt they hadn't formally become scientists. And so we struggled with the issue of how to give them credit. And we see this happening again and again. In many of our projects, we see discussions on our fora and on the tools we build for discussion, which use all sorts of advanced techniques to go way beyond the click to classify model of, of citizen science. But the hardest thing to get people to engage with is the literature. So we haven't yet solved the problem of taking those people and getting them, A, to read the scientific literature. There are problems there that are well known. But how do I get a citizen scientist to report in a form that's useful to the wider community of professional scientists their work on a part of the moon or on a uh, part of the uh, planet or a new planet they've discovered uh, or on an interesting piece of the seafloor that they've seen? And so our challenge for the next few years is to try and build that level of tool as well. We've, we've made a start. Um, I'm going to skip the planet example. Suffice it to say that loads of cool stuff happens with planets. Let, we, we've got this experimental site called letters.zooniverse.org, which is, you know, journal is scary, but a letter retains that. You write it and send it, and it's done metaphor, which is helpful. And we're trying to encourage people to write paragraph-scale papers, you know, paragraph to a page, to report what they've done, and then filter those so that the science teams can engage uh, with those advanced users. So rigor we have, openness facilitates our projects. We need open data in order to run these projects. And if you make more of the data open, our volunteers can get further. But what we're not yet, what we haven't achieved is an open communication with even quite advanced citizen scientists. Because we, just like the problem of having one student who looked at 50,000 galaxies, we don't scale. And we have such a, we have 800,000 registered users, and we don't have time to talk to them. And there has to be a technological solution in there, and I look forward to talking about that more. Thanks a lot.